next on Unsolved Mysteries. Troubling evidence in the assassination of Senator Robert Kennedy raises the question, was Sirhan Sirhan the only gunman? It is known as the Gurdon Light. For more than 80 years, the same eerie apparition has been seen by hundreds of eyewitnesses. But what is it? A tragic accident leaves three young children motherless. Within days, Tina Sheets is separated from her two brothers. She will spend the rest of her life trying to find them. Rapper Young Lay is headed for stardom. When his girlfriend is murdered, her house is set on fire, and his son is kidnapped. What happened? Join us for five cases with twists and turns that you can hardly believe. I'm Dennis Farina, and you're watching Unsolved Mysteries. Somewhere between New York and Washington, D.C. June 1968. A funeral train carrying the body of Senator Robert F. Kennedy slowly makes its way to the nation's capital. Along the route, thousands mourn the loss of a favorite son. Three days earlier, Robert Kennedy had been assassinated at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles, California. For those who were there, the agonizing moments that followed the shooting will never be forgotten. By that time, the pandemonium had broken loose. I mean, everybody was screaming. There were people yelling, Kennedy was shot, Kennedy was shot. Get an ambulance, get a doctor. Many people jumped on Sirhan and hitting him, yelling and screaming. Somebody was trying to get the gun. They couldn't get the gun out of his hand. It was like frozen in his hand. So I was afraid somebody was going to snap his back, and I thought they'd just snap him like a matchstick. And Greer finally got possession of the gun and gave it to Rafer Johnson. And it was agreed, you know, Johnson was to hold on to that gun, not give it to anyone until uh, the police arrived. Sirhan B. Sirhan was convicted of the first degree murder of Robert Kennedy. Sirhan never denied killing Kennedy but has claimed on several occasions that he cannot remember the period of time of the shooting. The final report of the Los Angeles Police Department definitively states that Sirhan acted alone and fired the fatal shot. It seems that every political assassination triggers conspiracy theories. The murder of Robert Kennedy is no exception. In this case, some researchers and eyewitnesses believe that a second gun was fired in the Ambassador Hotel and that it may not have been Sirhan Sirhan who fired that fatal shot. The evening of June 4th began as a celebration. I thank all of you who made this possible this evening. All With a victory in the California primary, Senator Kennedy became the favorite to win the Democratic presidential nomination. My thanks to all of you, and now it's on to Chicago, and let's win there. After concluding his speech, Senator Kennedy was scheduled for a press conference in the Colonial Room, about 40 yards away. He exited the rear of the stage, turned right, traveled down the hallway, and entered the hotel's kitchen pantry. Kennedy was escorted by hotel maitre d', and paused to shake hands with the kitchen staff. Sirhan Sirhan fired a 22 caliber revolver with a cylinder capable of holding eight rounds. He was immediately restrained, but managed to keep firing the gun until it was empty. Robert Kennedy died 26 hours later. Five bystanders were also seriously injured, but survived the attack. 
Sirhan Sirhan was taken into custody by the Los Angeles Police Department. They organized a 40-member task force known as Special Unit Senator, or SUS. The former chief of detectives with overall responsibility for the investigation was Robert Houghton. The SUS organization was created not only to investigate the assassination, but any ramification of that uh, assassination that could uh, possibly be a conspiracy. We didn't know that it wasn't the time it occurred. We had no idea what the exact facts were. By the end of their investigation, the LAPD concluded, quote, the right person was arrested and prosecuted. There's no question in my mind that Sirhan had killed Kennedy and they acted alone. The morning after the shooting, police discovered Sirhan's notebook in his apartment. Three weeks earlier, he had written, Robert F. Kennedy must be assassinated. The case seemed open and shut. The weapon taken from Sirhan was a 22 caliber Ivor Johnson revolver, which held eight rounds. The LAPD determined that eight bullets were fired in the pantry and that all eight came from Sirhan's gun. The official report concluded the bullets that struck Kennedy were the first ones fired from a distance of one to six inches. However, the exact sequence in which the shots were fired is unclear. But could a second gun also have been fired that night? This computer-generated simulation of the shooting is based on the official diagram. Sirhan is depicted by the red figure and Robert Kennedy by the white. The LAPD has positioned Kennedy with his right shoulder turned towards Sirhan. One bullet entered the back of his head, just behind his right ear. This was the fatal shot. The second penetrated the senator's right shoulder and lodged near his spine. A third bullet entered Kennedy's back, angling upward. It exited through his chest and was believed lost somewhere in the ceiling. A fourth passed through the right shoulder pad of his suit jacket. This bullet also angled upward and, according to the LAPD, then struck a bystander, Paul Schrade, in the forehead. I've talked to Paul Schrade. Paul said that he had to be nine feet tall or have his head on Kennedy's shoulder in order to be hit with this bullet. But this is key for the LAPD that this is believed that that, that bullet hit Paul Schrade, because if not, then there's another bullet in that room, which means there's a second gun. According to the LAPD version, four other bullets struck bystanders. One of them ricocheted downward from the ceiling and hit campaign worker Elizabeth Evans in the head. But medical records show that the bullet which struck Evans entered at an upward angle. If a bullet ricochets from the ceiling and comes down through another tile, it's going in a downward direction. You can't have a bullet going in a downward direction medically enter from any other direction than downward yet her bullet entered going upward. The autopsy of Senator Kennedy concluded that the fatal shot, as well as the other two bullets that hit him, were fired from point-blank range, about one to one and a half inches away. However, the eyewitnesses who testified at Sir Han's trial placed the gun muzzle a foot to three feet away from Kennedy, not one and a half inches. If that, guy, uh, that, that, that bullet which killed Kennedy it was an inch away from, from his head. This bullet didn't come from, from uh, Sehan. Did not come from Sehan. Because he never got that close. In a moment, we'll hear several accounts that suggest a second gun was fired during the assassination of Robert Kennedy. In 1969, Sirhan B. Sirhan was convicted and sentenced to life in prison for the murder of Senator Robert Kennedy. But in the years following, some researchers believe they have found evidence that Sirhan did not fire the only bullets. If that bullet which killed Kennedy was an inch away from his head, this bullet didn't come from, from uh, Sirhan. Did not come from Sirhan because he never got that close. Carl Euchre was the maitre d' who was leading Senator Kennedy through the pantry 
at the time of the shooting. Mr. Kennedy was shaking hands. I was holding his hand, his arm. I was trying to pull him, getting into the colonial room. By that time, Shahan came behind me. He was trying to get through me, but I was pushing him back. And then I saw the gun when he shot him twice. Grabbed him, got him in the headlock, and pushed the gun away. And I was holding Shahan over the steam table, and he kept shooting. And I say it again, and again, and again. That gun never got that close to Mr. Kennedy's head. At the trial, Euchre testified that Sirhan fired only two shots before he was forced away from Kennedy. However, the official report stated that four shots were fired before Sirhan was restrained. The gun was, I'd say, approximately anywhere from one to two feet away from him. He was not an inch away from Kennedy's head because he was across the room on this ice thing, and the room, I don't know the dimensions of the room, but he was not an inch away. None of the eyewitnesses who testified at the trial believed that the gun could have been one and a half inches away from Kennedy. However, the LAPD determined that all the eyewitnesses were mistaken about what they had seen due to the panic and chaos of the moment. But that doesn't ring true with eyewitness Richard Lubick, who claims that he saw a security guard pull his gun during the shooting and then leave the room. I noticed that there is a gentleman in some type of a uniform and he has a gun out. That gun is in his hand. But that gun was not aimed at Sirhan, who was, had just fired. It was in his hand, aimed down. Not at Kennedy, but down toward the floor. The security guard has acknowledged that he unholstered his weapon that night, but denies that it was fired. He cooperated with police and was cleared by the LAPD of any involvement in the attack. We could not make any connection between Sirhan and this guard prior to that evening, none at all. That meant that and it would be a, a phenomenal leap of logic to think they would both be in the kitchen at the same time unless there was a connection. So we did not and do not, I do not in any way believe there's a second gun involved. Can't get a match. A lawsuit filed by one of the surviving victims resulted in a re-examination of the firearms evidence. A panel of experts compared the three intact bullets recovered from the victims with bullets fired from Sir Han's revolver. Their findings did not rule out the possibility of a second gunman. The three victim bullets were identified as having come from the same gun. The Sir Han gun has never been identified as firing those victim bullets and that that in and of itself is not conclusive that the Sir Han gun didn't do the firing. So that we're left with a dilemma that uh, we have three victims struck by bullets from the same gun, but we don't know whose gun it was. The LAPD says that there were six victims who were hit by eight bullets. They say that Sir Han made good on all eight shots. They've accounted for all the bullets. You prove one more bullet, there's a second gun in that room. Photographs taken of the pantry entrance add to the possibility that more than eight shots were fired. This FBI photograph identifies two bullet holes in the center divider between the two doors which are not accounted for in the official report. This is the FBI's photograph from the scene and their accompanying caption from the June 8, 1968 FBI report. E2, a close-up view of the two bullet holes of area described above. Here's E2, and these are the two bullet holes as the FBI describes them. Not alleged bullet holes, bullet holes. I saw two bullet holes in a center divider. I saw two bullets in the holes. I know what I saw, and the issue obviously is that others say that they weren't there. It's a supposition on my part that it, the door jams 
Whatever was in there that was looked like bullets were extracted and found not to be bullets. I presume that was done, but I don't have personal knowledge of that. I have serious reservations whether or not any of Bobby's wounds were inflicted by Sirhan's gun. I, at this point, feel that there probably was a second gun there and that it was fired. Portions of the wooden door frames were removed by police from the pantry and booked into evidence. However, if they could have shed any light on this issue, the question is now moot. According to the LAPD, they were destroyed two months after Sirhan's conviction. I think that the LAPD thought they had an open and shut case. And when extra bullets showed up and when other crime scene evidence didn't jibe with the official version, I think the question became one of, Nothing's going to bring him back. So why confuse all of this with the facts? And I think that the case just rested there. Final services for Robert Francis Kennedy were held at St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City and were televised live to the nation. My brother need not be idealized or enlarged in death beyond what he was in life. To be remembered simply as a good and decent man who saw wrong and tried to right it, saw suffering and tried to heal it, saw war and tried to stop it. Those of us who loved him and who take him to his rest today pray that what he was to us and what he wished for others will someday come to pass for all the world. More than four decades after Robert Kennedy's death, debate about the second gunman continues. A recent study of an audio tape recorded in the pantry that night suggests a total of 13 shots being fired. The conflicting evidence is likely to be debated for years to come. Next, a mysterious light haunts the railroad tracks of Gurdon, Arkansas. Is it a natural phenomenon or the prowling ghost of a murdered, Railroad worker. Gurdon, Arkansas. One of the many nearly identical towns along the railroad between St. Louis and Dallas. But Gurdon is a little bit different. As darkness falls, the locals anticipate the arrival of their very own unsolved mystery. For decades on the tracks just outside of town, eerie lights have magically appeared. I'd say that I've seen it where I couldn't write it off as being anything else probably 20, 25 times at least. And I'm a very skeptical person. Over the years, I have personally seen it hundreds of times with my father and my family. I've seen the light at least 60 or 70 times. Uh, and of course, usually when you see it one time in that evening, you can see it several times in succession. What is the Gurdon light? A natural phenomenon, a long running prank, or perhaps something otherworldly? A legend that goes back to the 1930s may explain it. Around midnight on a chilly winter night, section foreman Will McLean confronted one of his workers, Lewis McBride. Got something I need to tell you, and I want you. It doesn't concern any of you boys, now go on, clock out. The day before, a freight train had derailed just outside of Gurdon. This is your last night, McBride. Get your pay, get on out of here. What? McLean believed that McBride had sabotaged a section of the track. I don't want to hear any more about it. Just pick up your pay and get off the yard. I need this job. Don't. The hell the matter with you? No. When McLean didn't return home, a search party was quickly assembled. They came upon a trail of blood and followed it along the tracks to the edge of town. At the end of the trail, they found the lifeless body of Will McLean. 
By dawn, McBride had confessed to the murder. In February of 1932, he was executed at the state penitentiary. Soon after that, people began seeing the Gurdon light on a regular basis. Local legend said that it was the ghost of Will McLean, doomed to spend eternity walking the tracks with his lantern. One of the first sightings was reported by a conductor named John. When he stepped out of the back of the caboose one night, he was startled by what he saw. They say that John went out on the back platform to investigate, and uh, the light was real far off and kind of faint, but it seemed to be traveling at the same speed they were. All of a sudden, it just shot up, and he's just like paralyzed, hanging on to the grab iron and just transfixed, staring right into the light. According to John, the light followed the train for more than a mile. Finally, it veered off in the direction of the cemetery. Ever since, looking for the Gurdon light has become something of a local pastime. If you go down there uh, with some regularity, uh, you're definitely going to see it after a while. Walking down the tracks in the total darkness always left you with a little eerie feeling. I've seen it come on in a quick flash and seen it fade in and then fade back out. The descriptions of the light are quite consistent. It hovers one to three feet above the tracks and is rarely visible for more than 10 seconds at a time. The whole town has seen it at some point in time. It's not a figment of anybody's imagination. It does exist. It is there. What is it? That's the question. Is the Gurdon light, as some believe, the ghost of Will McLean? Or is there a rational scientific explanation? For years, Dr. Charles Lemming, a physics professor at Henderson State University, took his classes to Gurdon in search of the answer. When I first went out to see the Gurdon light and studied the area maps, I was pretty confident that the light always originated from car headlights on an interstate bridge a few miles away. The light is usually seen in this area, just outside Gurdon. The highway lies to the southwest, four miles away. The problem with the headlight theory is that we could find reliable accounts of people that reported the Gurdon light well before the interstate bridge that we thought was the origin of the uh, headlights was opened. Yet another theory is based on the fact that dense swamp vegetation releases gas as it decomposes. Spontaneous combustion of these gases will produce a display of light. The theory of it being swamp gas uh, doesn't hold up to me uh, just because I've seen it in, on a windy night. Uh, so that would eliminate any sort of swamp gas out there. The closest theory that I've come to for explaining the Gurdon light is the piezoelectric effect. And piezoelectricity is a simple phenomenon where if you squeeze um, crystals such as quartz or Rochelle salt, you get an electric current out of them. Gurdon sits on top of huge deposits of quartz crystals, along with the active fault line known as the New Madrid Fault. Michael Klingen believes that when the plates shift, electric charges are released from the crystals and are seen above ground as the Gurdon light. People tend to say that the light appeared after the murder of Will McLean. That also coincides with a major earthquake on the New Madrid fault line. So that tends to support my piezoelectric theory. Klingen admits that there is one large hole in his theory. He cannot explain how the charge migrates to the surface or why it is concentrated in a ball-like shape. Do we really want to know what it is? Because that would take all the mystery out of it and all the fun. And, and I would like to see my children's children take their children down there, just like our parents took us down there. It's a perfect setting for a ghost story. So, what is the secret of the Gurdon Light? Well, until a solid theory comes along, we're left with the legend of Will McLean's ghost wandering the railroad tracks with his lantern forever. Next, 
Three children are separated when their mother dies in a terrible accident. 30 years later, Tina Sheets is still looking for her two lost brothers. Toledo, Ohio, a highway under construction, a young single mother hurrying home to her three small children, and then disaster. <laughs> 26 year old Patricia Lambrand was killed instantly. A few miles away, her children waited patiently at the home of their great aunt. That evening, the television brought the tragedy front and center. Look, there's mom's car on TV. Suddenly, they were motherless. Patricia's one-year-old son, Craig, nicknamed Chipper, two-year-old Christopher, Chrissy for short, and her daughter, Tina, then four years old. The day before was my brother Chrissy's second birthday. And I remember the birthday cake and the people at the party. And my next memory goes immediately to my aunt on the phone crying. Tina had only the vaguest concept that something terrible had happened. She had no idea that she and her brothers were about to be separated forever. Chrissy and Chipper were eventually handed over to foster care. Tina was uprooted as well, leaving the home of her great aunt to live with her grandparents. I was very upset and could not understand why my mother and my brothers were gone. I felt as though I was bad, that I had done something terribly awful for all this to happen to me, and for everybody to have been taken from me. As I grew up, I missed not having Chrissy and Chip were there. I knew that they were somewhere and that I wanted to be with them, but you know, it was out of my control as to where any of us went. And the older I got, the more I knew I had the ability to find them. Tina started looking when she was 16. What is it? It's the address of the foster home where Chrissy and Chipper were taken. Her great aunt gave her the first clues. No, that's the place where they were taken. I don't know what happened to them after that. Tina learned that Chrissy and Chipper's foster parents had moved away. She then went door to door, hoping the neighbors could help. Hello. Hi, I'm trying to locate a family that used to take in foster kids. Tina's efforts eventually paid off. Yeah. I'm trying to find my two brothers. Their names were Chipper and Chrissy, and I believe they lived with her for a while. Um, I remember those two, yes. They're cute little boys, yeah. They I were... remember them. Tina was thrilled. She got the name of the foster mother, Doris Sindel, and then spent the next eight years trying to locate her. Finally, they connected. When I first told her who I was, I asked her if she ever lived in Toledo, and she said yes. And I asked her if she was ever a foster parent, and she said yes. And I told her I believed that she had fostered my brothers, and she said, my babies, Chrissy and Chipper. And I nearly fell off of my chair. Chrissy and Chipper had stayed with Doris for almost two years until they were adopted by a couple from Michigan. Tina visited Doris as soon as she could. She wanted to hear every detail. This was taken at Deer Park. This is Doris had saved everything. The home movies, the photographs, even the boys' tiny bow ties. These are the actual ties. When I handed her the bow ties, I had no intentions of letting her keep those bow ties. But I didn't have the heart to take them back because she looked with them with such loving care, and she couldn't speak. She cried. It just felt as they had actually worn these. I was that much closer to them. And I just wanted to be able to, to be with them. Based on these childhood photographs, a police sketch artist drew age-progressed sketches of Chrissy and Chipper. 
Tina hoped that these images might reunite her with her long lost brothers. I have a longing to be with them. I don't feel like my life is complete without them. There's a lot of missing pieces and um, I need to be with them and I need them to know their family. Update. On the night of our broadcast, Tina was at our phone center when her youngest brother called in. Chipper, this is Tina. I'm your sister. I don't know if you know you have a sister. Tina learned that both Chip and her other brother Chris lived in West Virginia. After 32 years, Tina could hardly find the words to express what she was feeling. It's been a long time. It was hard for me to, to know if you or Chris even would remember me. I'm elated. I don't know how to explain it. Um, it's uh, an, a solved mystery. <laughs> a few weeks after the broadcast, Tina joined her brothers for their first Christmas together in more than 30 years. Tina would still like to locate her biological father, John Edward Lamoran. He was born in Detroit and lived with the family in Los Angeles. If you have any information about John Edward Lamoran, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, a house is set afire, a young woman is murdered, and the four-week-old son of a rap musician is kidnapped. His name is Lathan Williams. To his fans, he's Young Lay, a rising star in the rap music world. But without warning, he would become the center of a bizarre double mystery. It was a tragedy that tore him from the two most important people in his life. A case that has stumped the Vallejo police for years. In the spring of 1996, Lathan Williams was on the fast track to rap stardom. He had just signed a recording deal. His new video was about to be released, and his girlfriend had just given birth to their first child, a boy named Lazan. What I feel about Lazan was, it's the first son, uh, the summer finna come, you know what I'm saying? I'm finna uh, be with him, you know what I'm saying, take care of him. It was, and it was experience to me, you know what I'm saying? And I was happy. Lathan's girlfriend, 17-year-old Daphne Boyden, lived with her grandmother in Vallejo. Daphne was working hard to finish high school while caring for Lazan. One day, Daphne's grandmother, Reva Lee Boyden, was getting ready to go out when the doorbell rang. Is Daphne home? Yeah, come on in, she's in the back. Daphne? Yeah. You have company? Daphne was getting a lot of visitors. She was the mother of a local rap star's baby. Everybody wanted to see Lathan's son. I came by to see the baby. Oh, yeah. so cute. Yeah, can sit down. Daphne, I'm going to play bingo. I'll be going. Reva Lee did not recognize these two girls, but Daphne obviously knew them. Everything seemed fine. Within the hour she was rushing home, neighbors had told her that her house was on fire. I tried to break loose. She said, no, no, don't go in. So she said, your granddaughter is dead. The news got worse. The fire did not start accidentally. Daphne had been murdered and the house torched to cover up the crime. And baby Lazan was missing, apparently kidnapped. For Lathan, the news was devastating. I was saying, please, to myself, please, Daphne, come walking around this corner, you know what I'm saying, with this baby. Daphne's death outraged the community. Hundreds turned out for a march memorializing Daphne and urging Lazan's safe return. The question on everybody's mind was why. I did hear that some girls were threatening her and 
I didn't understand that, you know, but they said it was behind my son. I don't know for sure or not what the situation is, but it seems to me as somebody wanted a baby and they wanted to do away with her and why, I don't know. 10 months earlier, Lathan himself had been the victim of a holdup. Break yourself! What's up, homie? You know what time it is? I thought we was cold! Give up the damn loot or I'm busting! Come on, come on! Anybody moves, everybody dies! One bullet hit Lathan, piercing his brain. When he recovered, he testified against the shooter. It's only natural to assume that there could be some possible connection there, that it may be some type of retaliation. We don't want to overinflate that possibility. Uh, but again, it's unsolved, so we're trying not to uh, close any doors on it. However, Lathan is convinced that the two attacks are not connected. Had nothing to do with it, you know what I'm saying? Because they would have uh, tried to get at me, you know what I'm saying? My life would have been in danger. Not, uh, you know what I'm saying, my uh, baby mama's life and my kid. Whatever the motive, Police had no doubt that whoever killed Daphne also kidnapped Lazon. We still feel that there's hope to, to recover the baby. Obviously, we feel it's uh, still alive, and we hope with this information on a nationwide level, it can lead to some uh, uh, further leads that uh, eventually lead to an arrest. Update. Six years after baby Lazon Williams was kidnapped, both he and his abductors were found. Police received the tip that the boy was living with a woman named Latasha Brown. She and her cousin, Osinetta Williams, were arrested and charged with the kidnapping of Lazan and the murder of his mother, Daphne Boyden. Apparently, Brown, who had once been involved with Lathan Williams, was jealous of his relationship with Daphne. Osinetta Williams agreed to testify against Brown and received a sentence of 13 years and eight months in prison. She served her time and has been released. Brown was sentenced to 37 years for murder and kidnapping. One day, a cure for cancer will become a reality. But until then, early diagnosis is our best hope. And to help in that quest, you may be surprised to learn that some researchers are looking to one of the world's oldest detection devices, a dog's nose. It has been estimated that a dog's sense of smell is more than 200 million times stronger than that of humans. It can sniff out people, animals, drugs, bombs, and cadavers. And now it seems it may be able to detect cancer as much as two years before doctors can diagnose it. Dwayne Pickle has been training dogs professionally for more than three decades. When a local dermatologist wondered if cancer had a signature scent and if dogs could smell it, Dwayne decided to find out. I talked to several nurses at the hospital and they said, yes, I can smell cancer myself. And said, Vance, when you get off the elevator floor at the hospital, there's something unique about that floor as far as smell is concerned. Not necessarily offensive, but something very unique. Dwayne decided to focus on the fastest growing type of cancer in America, skin cancer, especially the deadly kind known as melanoma. Melanoma begins on the surface of the skin and at that point is 100% curable. However, if you ignore it, it will grow deeper into the skin and eventually it will reach the blood vessels. Once it reaches the blood vessels, it can spread around the body and reach the vital organs. Once it's done that, there is no treatment. Duane hid real melanoma cells inside plastic tubes, hoping the scent was strong enough for a dog to detect. He started the experiment with George, a standard schnauzer already trained to sniff out bombs. Once George was given the scent, Duane hid the canister. I wasn't sure whether it was going to have a strong smell or whether it was going to be a, a, like a salt and have a very weak smell. And, uh, but we found out that it has a very strong smell. Duane did a number of experiments using other body tissues and other dogs to make sure that they were really detecting cancer. Apparently, they were. 
Whether it was cells in test tubes or concealed under bandages placed on human subjects, out of 451 searches, George and other cancer-trained dogs had a 99.8% success rate. Doing that, we're going to have the dog check here. We're going to start at the head. Finally, Tallahassee police officer Eddie Messer volunteered as a subject. A biopsy on a suspicious spot on Eddie's right shoulder had already tested negative for skin cancer. George slowly went over Eddie's body, checking each bandage thoroughly. When George reached the suspicious spot, he reacted to the smell of cancer, though there was none on the bandage. When George first put his nose to that spot, you know, it felt a little funny there, but working with dogs at the airport and what have you, you know, it makes you think there, say maybe he knows what he's talking about. For a second opinion, Dwayne's partner, Glenda Manassey, brought in her cancer-trained dog, Breeze. Breeze confirmed George's diagnosis. Eddie had a second biopsy. It was still negative, but Dwayne was sure it was wrong. And they called me and said, well, the spot came back negative. I said, I'm very sorry. My dog said it's melanoma. It's melanoma. So then they took off the whole lesion, and they froze it, and they sent it to a lab in Cleveland. And they shaved it just one little stroke at a time. It actually took four and a half days later before they found there was a spot in the middle of that lesion that was amelanomic level three. If it hadn't have been for the dog, if it hadn't have been for this pathologist checking on this one spot for four and a half days and finding yes, proving the dog was right, in a couple of years it could have been beyond repair. But now we found it early enough so that it is repairable and that you're gonna do fine. This could lead to some exciting research in finding out what is it that the dog's smelling um, and that that may lead to blood tests or other tests to find these molecules. Um, as a detection system for cancers. Until those molecules are isolated, it will be up to dogs like George to sniff around and save lives.